You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Welcome to episode 67 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. As y'all will recall, we've spent the last several episodes setting the stage for the Battle of Wilson's Creek. We've seen that, basically, at the start of the Civil War, Missouri was a mess. And then by late July 1861, Brigadier General Nathaniel Lyon and his command dubbed the Army of the West, were at Springfield, deep in southwestern Missouri, trying to keep that portion of the state in Union hands. Determined to drive Lyon away from Springfield was an ad hoc southern army of Arkansas State troops, Missouri State Guardsmen, and Confederate Army soldiers, about 12,000 men in all, under the overall command of Confederate Brigadier General Ben McCulloch. By the first week of August, Lyon's force of volunteers and U.S. regulars had shrunk to about 5,000 or so men as the 90-day enlistments of the volunteers began to expire and as repeated requests for reinforcements had been denied. Those manpower concerns, added to Lyon's deteriorating supply situation, meant that the Army of the West would have to pull back a 100 miles to Rolla, the nearest railhead. But Lyon didn't like the idea of withdrawing before he'd given the enemy a good kicking, and he was also concerned that the enemy would overtake him as he withdrew from Springfield and force him to fight at a disadvantage. So he decided to gamble and strike out at McCulloch. By that time, the southern army was only about 10 miles away, just to the southwest of Springfield. The southerners' encampment lay on both sides of Wilson's Creek, where the stream ran roughly north-south and the wire road crossed it, the road running from southwest to northeast toward Springfield. Lyon reported that, quote, I propose to throw our whole force upon him at once and endeavor to rout him before he can recover from his surprise, end quote. Well, Lyon's preemptive strike against a superior enemy would certainly be unexpected, But then Colonel Franz Siegel added an even more surprising twist. The German-born officer convinced Lyon to split the small federal command and make a two-pronged attack on the Confederate camp. Lyon would take 4,200 men and 10 guns and attack the northern end of the enemy encampment, while Siegel led 1,200 men and six guns around to the south and assaulted the other side of the rebel camp. Siegel's plan was extremely risky some might even say foolhardy, but it was so audacious it just might work. We will say that to us, Lyon's original intent does seem to have been to advance quickly and strike the enemy a surprise blow with a small army, really a a quick jab that would knock the enemy off balance and keep them that way while Lyon then withdrew from Springfield and retreated to Rolla. But by making the decision to approve Siegel's risky plan, Lyon seems to have changed what he hoped to accomplish and seems to have gone all in. For Lyon's decision to go with Siegel's strategy doesn't really make much sense to us unless the federal commander now hoped to actually inflict a decisive crushing defeat upon the rebels. But at any rate, Lyon's small army, now divided into those two columns, filed out of Springfield on the evening of August 9th. After marching through the darkened countryside, they would fall upon the enemy camp the next morning, the morning of Saturday, August 10th, 1861. Meanwhile, as y'all will recall, Ben McCulloch, ironically, had also made plans for his army 
unofficially christened the Western Army, to also move out on the night of Friday, August 9th, and make a surprise attack on the Federals in Springfield the next morning. But then storm clouds rolled in that evening, threatening rain. McCulloch was aware that many of his men lacked proper equipment, like leather cartridge boxes, and so he knew that marching through a rainstorm would mean that many of his men might enter battle with wet powder or cartridges. Not wanting to take that risk, the Confederate commander reluctantly decided to postpone the attack on Springfield, and so at the last minute, the march was called off. But as y'all know from the end of the last episode, the Southern Army's pickets had already been called in to prepare for the anticipated movement to Springfield. But after the march was called off, no one thought to send the sentries back out to their posts. This disastrous blunder with the pickets meant that McCulloch's army would have virtually no warning of the approach of an enemy force. When Lyon's column left Springfield, it followed roads leading west before turning south and marching cross-country toward the enemy encampment. At 1 a.m., when his men were only about two miles from their target, Lyon halted the column and allowed the men to rest. About 4 a.m., as light began to show in the eastern sky, the troops fell into ranks and the march continued. Soon the Federals encountered enemy soldiers, not alert sentries, but rather hungry foragers who had risen early and gone out into the countryside north of their encampment in search of provisions. Upon encountering the advancing Union soldiers, the startled Southerners quickly turned around and hightailed it back toward their camps and raised the alarm. Meanwhile, Lyon, thinking he had finally run into the enemy picket line, he deployed his leading units into line of battle and continued to press forward. As the alarm was raised in the southern camp, a small body of horsemen, Missouri State Guardsmen, were the first to respond, and they quickly rode out to contest the Federals' advance. The 300 horsemen deployed on a ridge that was actually the northern spur of a broad, flat rise that would soon be aptly christened Bloody Hill. Lyon, finding the enemy positioned to dispute his advance, he sent forward his leading elements, already drawn up in line of battle, with the 2nd Missouri on the right, Captain Joseph Plummer's battalion of regulars on the left, and Captain Joseph Totten's artillery battery in the center, supported by the 1st Missouri. That line of battle rolled forward and had no trouble driving off the small band of State Guard horsemen on the northern spur of Bloody Hill. But then, as the Federal advance continued, Lyon could see a larger body of dismounted State Guard horsemen forming another defensive line to his front on Bloody Hill itself. To deal with the enemy forming up on the hill to his front, Lyon moved up the 1st Kansas to strengthen his forward line and then continued his drive straight ahead. But he ordered most of the remainder of his force to use farm roads to maneuver around to the southwest in an attempt to outflank the rebels formed up on Bloody Hill. But Lyon's attempt to outflank the enemy resistance proved unnecessary, since his line of battle outnumbered the state guard horsemen at least three to one, and as Lyon's men surged forward, they easily pushed the smaller enemy force off of Bloody Hill. The fleeing Missourians took refuge at the base of the hill, where Sterling Price was struggling to organize a force to halt the Federal advance. Meanwhile, that seemingly unstoppable Federal onslaught ground to a halt of its own volition up on the crest of Bloody Hill as Lyon halted to sort out his formation after its advance, and also to wait for those units he'd sent to outflank the hill to return and bolster his line of battle. But while he waited and consolidated his position on Bloody Hill, Lyon, having divided his force in that unnecessary attempt to work around the enemy flank, The Federal commander now became worried about his own flank, so he divided his command yet again, and he dispatched Captain Joseph Plummer with 300 regulars and some mounted Home Guard cavalry to cross over to the east side of Wilson's Creek and secure the wire road. From there, Plummer's force could protect the left flank of Lyon's line on Bloody Hill. And so at that point, by around 5.30 or so, the Federals had successfully seized the high ground north of the enemy camps, 
But instead of pausing at that moment, instead of worrying about his flanks, with perfect hindsight, we know that Lyon probably should have just continued driving forward down the south slope of Bloody Hill, pressing his advantage over the Missouri State Guardsman, who Sterling Price was struggling to form up below at the base of the hill. Instead of pressing forward, though, Lyon's advance stalled as he spent almost an hour consolidating his position on Bloody Hill. And as we'll see, that loss of momentum will eventually prove fatal, literally, for Nathaniel Lyon. While Lyon consolidated his position up on Bloody Hill, The Federals came under fire from a battery of enemy artillery over on the east side of Wilson's Creek. Those four guns were manned by Arkansans from Little Rock, and they were commanded by Captain William E. Woodruff. Woodruff's men were well drilled and sported uniforms of natty gray jackets and trousers trimmed in red. Ironically, just before the war started, Woodruff and his men had been trained by James Totten, who was one of the Federal battery commanders now facing them over on Bloody Hill. Totten had commanded the garrison at the Little Rock Arsenal just before the war, and he'd lent his expertise in training the Arkansas militia artillerymen. Here on the battlefield at Wilson's Creek, Totten now engaged in an artillery duel with his former pupils. But Woodruff's guns were sighted in a key strategic position astride the wire road, on high ground commanding both the major ford of Wilson's Creek and the Creek Valley. And so this morning, by simply being in the right place at the right time, the Arkansas battery was able to keep up a steady fire and harass the left end of Lyon's line on Bloody Hill, while Sterling Price formed up his units to oppose the Federal advance. The Southern High Command had been completely surprised by Lyon's attack. Ben McCulloch and Sterling Price were having breakfast together at Price's headquarters tent when they received the startling news that the Federals, advancing from the north, were just a short distance away. Price and McCulloch had hurried off to form up their commands. When Lyon allowed his advance to stall, it gave Sterling Price valuable time to organize a growing line of battle at the southern base of Bloody Hill. Making good use of that time, the Missourians soon had perhaps 2,000 infantrymen and dismounted cavalry ready to oppose the Federals up on the hill. Once he had finally consolidated his position on the crest of the hill to his satisfaction, Lyon cautiously decided to send out a reconnaissance in force, since he was unsure of the enemy's strength at the base of the hill. From his main battle line, Lyon sent out the 1st Missouri and six companies of the 1st Kansas to probe downhill. When the Federal reconnaissance ran into the state guardsmen deployed at the base of Bloody Hill, volleys of musketry shattered the morning air, and the fighting began in earnest. As the combat intensified, more units of state guardsmen came up and strengthened the Southerners' line. There amongst the high prairie grass, thickets, and scrub oaks, the Union soldiers of the 1st Missouri and the 1st Kansas made a stubborn stand as long as possible, but eventually they were pushed back uphill. In fact, as the Federals were pushed back, the State Guardsmen advanced in pursuit, and that advance spontaneously turned into an uncoordinated charge at Bloody Hill. To check the enemy advance, Lyon ordered the 2nd Kansas forward from its reserve position. But the second Kansas would take some moments to move forward, so to buy some time, Lyon had a portion of the first Kansas launch a bayonet charge to hold back the steadily advancing enemy. That fierce countercharge and the appearance of the second Kansas forced the Southerners to break off their attack and withdraw back down to the base of the hill. It was now about 8 a.m., and the first Southern assault on Bloody Hill had ended. Although neither side had gained a significant advantage in the encounter, the Southerners had already enjoyed dramatic success on another part of the battlefield. Y'all will recall how Lyon dispatched Captain Joseph Plummer with a detachment of 300 regulars and some mounted home guard cavalry to cross to the east side of Wilson's Creek and secure the wire road and the Federal's left flank on Bloody Hill. Well, Plummer had a difficult time finding a place to ford the creek, but once across, he marched his small force southward. About 6.30, they were crossing a large cornfield when Plummer noticed, just to the south, 
that battery of Arkansas artillery firing on his comrades over on Bloody Hill. Hoping to silence the enemy guns, Plummer pushed his men in that direction. Unfortunately for Plummer, Captain Woodruff, commanding the Arkansans, had also noticed the Federals' presence, and he'd sent a messenger to McCulloch's headquarters asking for help. In response, McCulloch sent Colonel James McIntosh, who took his own 2nd Arkansas Mounted Rifles, who were actually on foot, the 3rd Louisiana, and Colonel Dandridge McRae's Arkansas Battalion. Swiftly approaching the cornfield, McRae's battalion peeled off to directly support Woodruff's battery, but the remaining 1,100 Arkansans and Louisianans proved to be more than enough to handle Plummer's small force. McIntosh's men soon came within sight of a weed-choked rail fence that marked the southern edge of the cornfield, with the Federals just on the other side. McIntosh quickly deployed his troops into line and then moved the men forward to take cover behind the fence. Plummer reacted quickly as well. He had his small band of regulars, a mixture of veterans and new recruits, lay down as much fire as possible. One of the northern soldiers recalled, quote, In the beginning, we felt nervous and confused, like anyone suddenly exposed to danger. But we became warmed up with the excitement, and most of the men acted as if they had found an agreeable employment, end quote. But even though the tall, thick corn concealed them somewhat, the Federals were still at a distinct disadvantage, caught in an open field, vastly outnumbered, and in danger of being outflanked. So with few good options, Plummer decided to try and seize the initiative with a bayonet charge. But just as he was starting to pass the word for the assault, he was hit. A bullet shattered one of his ribs. At almost the same moment, McIntosh, whose men had been suffering under the regulars' disciplined fire, McIntosh also decided to launch his own charge. He hurried along the line and shouted, Get up, Louisiana! Do you all wish to be killed? Then he yelled, Charge! and vaulted over the fence. Although the Louisianans received word of the plan, only about half of the second Arkansas was told. But nevertheless, the 900 or so Southerners, who sprang to their feet with a yell and surged forward across the fence, were more than enough to push back the battered Federals. In his official report of the battle, McCulloch said, quote, A terrible conflict of small arms took place here. Notwithstanding the galling fire poured upon them, these two regiments, they leaped the fence and gallantly led by their two colonels, drove the enemy back, end quote. Despite having lost a quarter of their strength in the fight in the cornfield, the regulars did not panic but withdrew in reasonably good order, continuing to trade shots with the advancing Southerners. However, Plummer's hard-pressed men all knew that withdrawing across the creek while in contact with the enemy was going to be an extremely hazardous undertaking. Fortunately for Plummer, his predicament was noticed by a few of his comrades over on Bloody Hill. When they noticed Plummer retreating before a superior enemy force, some of the Federal cannon on the hilltop laid down a covering fire as the battered regulars withdrew back across Wilson's Creek. One of the retreating northerners, a private named Wiswell, noted how, quote, our batteries began to throw shell among them rather thick and thereby covered us in our retreat, end quote. The artillery fire caused few casualties among the southerners, but did cause a bit of alarm and confusion, enough to discourage them from pressing after the retreating Federals and causing the Louisianans in particular to become highly disorganized. Although the enemy artillery fire from across the creek forced them to stop their pursuit of Plummer and rather discombobulated them, McIntosh's Arkansans and Louisianans were elated. They decisively driven back the Federal force on the east side of the creek, and now the Southern Army's commanders could give their full attention to assaulting Lyon's position on Bloody Hill and to defeating Franz Siegel's column to the south. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you 
perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Like the column led by Nathaniel Lyon, Siegel's force had also marched through the darkened countryside toward the enemy encampment along Wilson's Creek. And like Lyon, Siegel had also halted his men and allowed them to rest once they drew near the enemy's position. And then at 2 a.m., Siegel's column had continued its advance. By 5.30, the Federals had managed to slip undetected into position on the east side of the creek. Siegel was on a high ridge overlooking Wilson's Creek, and across the stream was the farm of Joseph Sharp at the southern end of the enemy encampment. Siegel stealthily deployed four cannon on the ridge. Below them on the Sharp farm were about 1,500 unsuspecting southern cavalrymen. When the sound of musketry and cannon fire from Lyon's attack reached Siegel, he ordered his guns to open fire on the Southerners. Pandemonium erupted in the enemy camp. In the midst of the confusion, some of the Southern cavalrymen fled the battlefield and never returned, but others managed to form up, retreat, and then come back into the fight. Many others, even if initially dispersed by the surprise attack, eventually rallied and returned to the battle. By 7 o'clock, Siegel's men had come down off the ridge, were across the creek, and against little organized resistance, they had taken up a position blocking the wire road at the southern end of the enemy encampment. But as with Lyon, Siegel's initial success would soon evaporate in the face of determined enemy opposition. After they'd helped push Plummer's small federal force back across Wilson's Creek, the 3rd Louisiana was gathered up by Ben McCulloch, who had just observed the crisis that Siegel's surprise attack had caused at the Sharp Farm. Determined to deal with that situation at once, McCulloch grabbed the Louisianans, as well as a handful of Missouri State Guardsmen, and led them toward Siegel's position astride the wire road. McCulloch's attack would actually receive help from Siegel, since the German-born officer had deployed his men exceedingly poorly. Rather than form his men into line of battle, Siegel had deployed only about 250 men into line and kept the rest of his command closed up in column. Column was used for movement, not combat, so Siegel's men would be at a terrible disadvantage in a fight. When a body of infantry came marching down the road toward Siegel's position, he could see that the men were dressed in gray. Siegel's own men from St. Louis were dressed in gray. Remember, we've said before that gray was a popular color for pre-war militia uniforms, and Siegel knew that some of Lyon's men were also dressed in gray. Since Siegel was hoping that Lyon's troops would soon form a junction with him, Siegel and his officers cautioned their men not to fire on the unidentified troops. Just to be on the safe side, Siegel sent a man forward to verify the identity of the approaching soldiers. The mystery force was actually the 3rd Louisiana, and the unfortunate Union soldiers soon encountered McCulloch himself. But when he raised his musket to shoot the southern commander, he himself was shot down by a nearby Louisianan. McCulloch then turned in his saddle and waved the gray-clad Louisianans forward, and they fired a volley point-blank into the startled Federals. Siegel later reported, quote, It is impossible for me to describe the consternation and frightful confusion which was occasioned by this unfortunate event. 
To add to the consternation and frightful confusion, Southern artillery also opened up on Siegel's men. And unfortunately for the hapless Federals, Siegel's bungled deployment not only left them at a disadvantage when facing enemy infantry, it also left them bunched up and vulnerable to enemy artillery fire. One of the Federal soldiers, Sergeant Otto Lademan, bitterly described what happened next. Quote, Colonel Siegel's tactical skill, having deprived us of every opportunity of employing our arms, there was nothing left for us but run, and run we did like good fellows. End quote. Lademan added, If ever the Third Louisiana hold a regimental reunion, they ought to pass a resolution of thanks to Colonel Siegel for making their victory so very easy. Siegel's soldiers retreated from the battlefield in several different groups. Some withdrew in good order, but others were dispersed by Texas and Missouri cavalrymen who ran them down like, quote, cowboys after jackrabbits, end quote. Siegel himself narrowly avoided capture and managed to arrive unharmed back in Springfield well before his men made it back to town. And so by mid-morning, with two federal threats from Plummer and Siegel having been decisively dealt with, McCulloch and Price were now free to concentrate their attention on Nathaniel Lyon's force up on Bloody Hill. And just a footnote, but in February 1862, when Siegel was being considered for promotion, ten or so officers who had been present at Wilson's Creek submitted a sharply critical account of Siegel's performance. The officers insisted it was Siegel's egotistical desire for a separate command that led him to push the idea for dividing the outnumbered Union Army and making a two-pronged attack at Wilson's Creek, despite the fact that every other officer opposed the risky plan. Perhaps the officer's most telling critique was that Siegel made no attempt to rally his troops after they were driven from the battlefield, and he made no attempt to report his defeat to Lyon, but instead Siegel simply fled back to Springfield as quickly as he could. Meanwhile, back at Bloody Hill, despite the failure of their first uncoordinated charge up the hill, by 9 a.m. Sterling Price had readied his Missouri State Guardsmen for another assault. But the 3,500 Federal infantrymen and 10 guns on top of the hill held firm against the second Southern attack. That's because the uneven terrain and the men's lack of experience hindered Price's force from launching a truly coordinated assault on the Union position. Although the entire State Guard line of battle may have started off from the base of the hill in unison, the terrain and the brush and the trees on the hillside broke up the formations. And then as they came under fire, units reacted differently. Some went to ground and stayed put, some continued to advance, some retreated back down the hill. The most intense fighting took place around the two Federal artillery batteries. The skillfully manned cannon formed strong points in Lyon's line and helped force back the advancing enemy infantry with devastating rounds of canister fire. Nevertheless, about 9.30 a.m., in the confusion of battle, a gap had opened up in the Federal line. Lyon, who had already been wounded in the leg and side of the head, and had a horse shot out from under him, Lyon ordered the 2nd Kansas to fill the hole, and then the Federal commander rode beside the regiment's colonel as the men marched in that direction. But as the Kansans filled the gap, disaster struck. The Southerners let loose a volley, and Lyon, on horseback, was a conspicuous target. A bullet entered Nathaniel Lyon's left side, plowed through his heart and lungs, and exited the opposite side. His orderly, Private Albert Lehman, caught him as he fell from his horse, mortally wounded. Within moments, Nathaniel Lyon had breathed his last. With Lyon fallen, Major Samuel Sturgis, the highest-ranking regular army officer not dead or wounded, assumed command of the Federals clinging grimly to the top of Bloody Hill. Sturgis directed every available man into the defensive line to stem the rebel onslaught. The battle continued to seesaw all across the hillside. Shrouded by a cloud of gun smoke and sweltering under a blazing sun, the men of both sides fought desperately. Then, Sterling Price, with ammunition running low and casualties mounting, at about 10 o'clock, Price ordered his men to break off the fight and withdraw back down the hill. 
As the Southern infantry disengaged, they were covered by a reckless cavalry charge launched by Texas and our Arkansas horsemen. And so the second Southern assault on Bloody Hill had ended, but the battle was still far from over. After two failed attempts, Sterling Price ready to launch a third attack up Bloody Hill. This time, McCulloch contributed the remainder of the 3rd Louisiana, and N. Bart Pierce brought his entire 3rd Arkansas and most of his 5th Arkansas to Bloody Hill. About 1030, 3,000 Southerners moved up the hill. The Confederates launched an assault that Sturgis would call, quote, the fiercest and most bloody engagement of the day, end quote. But in savage fighting, the Federal line held firm. The Federal guns were once again the decisive factor, spewing round after round of deadly canister into the ranks of the Southern attackers. After about 45 minutes of both sides blazing away at each other with a storm of iron and lead, it proved too much for the attacking rebels, and finally the southern commanders ordered the men to break off the action and reform at the base of the hill. But up on Bloody Hill, after the last enemy assault had been repulsed, the Federals were exhausted and nearly out of ammunition. With large numbers of wounded added into the mix, and still not having heard anything from Siegel, Major Sturgis decided it was time to retreat. About 11.30, the Federals started their withdrawal from Bloody Hill. Unlike Siegel's pell-mell retreat from the southern end of the battlefield, Sturgis's force withdrew in good order. About two miles from the battlefield, the Federals halted at a spring. There, they learned that Siegel's column had been routed. Soon meeting up with some of Siegel's men, the Federals marched back to Springfield. Although all of the men were hungry and tired, the retreat under the scorching sun was particularly difficult for the wounded. They suffered from the pain of their wounds, lack of water, and want of medical attention. The Federals at Wilson's Creek had no organized Army medical staff, and so each unit was left to look after its own wounded. Only two ambulances had accompanied Lyon's column when it left Springfield, and so the wounded rode back to Springfield in wagons or else hobbled along as best they could. Sergeant Hugh Campbell recalled that, quote, It was painful to see men wounded in all forms, dragging their slow steps along, unable to procure room in the crowded wagons, end quote. Some of the Federal wounded were abandoned on the battlefield. Robert Friedrich of the 2nd Kansas found a friend suffering from a serious wound. A bullet had entered his friend's chest and exited between his shoulder blades. Friedrich took his hat, filled it with leaves, and gave it to his friend for a pillow. Friedrich stayed with him until the rest of the army had retreated, and then, quote, sadly took his hand and bade him goodbye. I never saw him again, end quote. Unaware that the enemy had retreated, when the determined Southerners moved up Bloody Hill for yet another attack, they gave a mighty shout when they realized the Yankees had withdrawn. N. Bart Pierce recalled, quote, we watched the retreating enemy through our field glasses and were glad to see him go, end quote. Despite their victory, pursuit of the enemy was never really an option. The Southerners were utterly exhausted, almost entirely out of ammunition, units were disorganized, and then there were hundreds of wounded of both sides who needed attention. Several impromptu field hospitals were established along the banks of Wilson's Creek, but southern surgeons and attendants were hard-pressed to give the wounded even basic services. And although every house, cabin, barn, or outbuilding in the vicinity of the battlefield was soon overflowing with wounded, two days after the battle, more wounded men still lay out in the sun without cover. A week after the battle, Dr. W. A. Cantrell of Arkansas wrote that from the time the battle opened until that moment, quote, I have seen and heard nothing but gunshot wounds and the groans of the dying and distressed, end quote. Cantrell said that many of the wounded were receiving poor medical attention and, quote, the greater portion, no attention at all, end quote. When the casualty figures at Wilson's Creek are placed in perspective with the number of men engaged, one realizes just what a hard-fought and blood-stained battle it was by any standard. The best estimate for losses suffered by the Southern Army is 277 dead and 945 wounded, or 12% of those engaged. The Federals suffered an estimated 285 killed, 873 wounded, and 186 missing, for a casualty rate of just over 24%. 
three of the federal units that fought on Bloody Hill, the 1st Missouri, 2nd Missouri, and 1st Kansas, suffered casualty rates over 35 percent. Indeed, over the entire course of the war, only six Union regiments had a larger total number of dead and mortally wounded in a single engagement than did the 1st Kansas at Wilson's Creek. The Federals rallied in Springfield, and then early the next morning, August 11th, they began a successful retreat to Rolla. Ben McCulloch, having accomplished his goal of helping the Missourians clear the southwest part of their state of the Federals, he took his Confederates back to Arkansas. Meanwhile, Sterling Price, attempting to capitalize on the victory at Wilson's Creek, soon surged north with his triumphant state guard. As we'll see in the next episode, he'll reach the Missouri River, and in September, at the so-called Battle of the Hemp Bales, Price will lay siege to the Federal garrison at Lexington, the largest town between St. Louis and Kansas City. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Wilson's Creek, The Second Battle of the Civil War and the Men Who Fought It, by William Garrett Piston and Richard W. Hatcher III. Except for the unfortunate way that Piston and Hatcher demonized Nathaniel Lyon at every opportunity, this book is actually a well-researched, detailed study of the battle and a must-have resource for anyone interested in what happened at Wilson's Creek. And then we also wanted to let you know that if you can get your hands on a copy of America's Civil War magazine from July 2013, you'll find that that issue has several really, really excellent maps of the Battle of Wilson's Creek in it. As always, you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. Y'all can also go to the website to qualify for our t-shirt giveaway. What we're going to do is give away one t-shirt with the podcast logo, just like the shirts Rich and I wore at Gettysburg this past summer. To qualify for the giveaway, you need to go to the website between now and next Saturday, March 29th, and make a donation of $10 or more to support the podcast, and that'll put your name in the hat. As Tracy just said, this is your last week to get in on this. We'll literally put the names of everyone who donates onto slips of paper, put those slips of paper into a hat, and during the episode we record next Sunday, March 30th, we'll pull a name out of the hat and that lucky person will win the t-shirt. And don't forget that you can increase your chances of winning the t-shirt by increasing your donation. So for every multiple of $10 you donate, your name will go on another slip of paper and go into the hat. For example, if you donate $20, then your name will go into the hat on two slips of paper. If you donate $30, then your name will go into the hat on three slips of paper, and so on. And we'll ship the t-shirt anywhere in the world, since we know we have listeners all across the globe. So we'll contact you about the size you want and everything, and then send it to you after we get it made up for just for you. Since the last episode, Didier V. from Virginia, Ryan L. from Michigan, Michael M. from Alaska, Harry C. from Virginia, and Jeffrey L. from Virginia, and Zachary M. from North Carolina, all made donations, and so their names will go into the hat for the drawing. And we appreciate their support of the podcast. So thanks, guys. And thanks to all of y'all for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.